guys and what a brand new video from me, Pickles Parker Reviews. Now today I will be giving you a ranking of all 16 films I saw last year in 2018. Now I reviewed three movies um, last year that I saw just after they came out and then the other 13 I didn't review at the time but ultimately reviewed in my last video which was a big hour long compilation of all the different reviews. And those are the films that I will be using today to um, do this ranking. The films are Black Panther, Maze Runner, The Death Cure, Ready Player One, Avengers Infinity War, Rampage, Deadpool 2, Solo, A Star Wars Story, Jurassic World, All in Kingdom, Mission Impossible Fallout, Ant-Man and the Wasp, The Festival, Venom, Johnny English Strikes Again, Ralph Breaks the Internet, Aquaman and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So those are the movies that I'll be will be ranking today. And just to make clear, the ratings that I'll be basing this ranking on are the ratings applied in my last video, which was the uh, latter thirteen. Um, and therefore, if there's any video, the other three films that I reviewed that uh, you know their ratings are irrelevant in these rankings because I didn't really think why I gave them these ratings so don't say oh Ray Player One got three and a half stars, Aquaman got three stars, how come it's above it? It's because I wasn't really thinking while I was doing it. That's just an example, that's not necessarily true um, but just watch the ranking to find out. Number 16, it will come to no surprise, that is Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Now, I really didn't like this movie. I thought it was pretty crap. Um, the basic premise is something that seems like we've done before, you know. Oh, we're back on the island again, except now there's a volcano. But that's only the first five minutes, and the rest is set on this boring, massive mansion. Why even call it Jurassic World if there's no park there? It makes itself all super serious, and it falls into a common trope that a lot of studios... Uh, use on their movies where they think, you know, let's remake this or let's make a sequel, but don't really dark and serious. On the success of the Dark Knight films, it seems that these studios think that means that it's going to be good, but it doesn't, and it doesn't work for many studios. Funnily enough, it didn't work for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. The great thing about Jurassic Park and Dr uh, is that, you know, there's so much adventure, you know, surrounding you know, this park full of dinosaurs. It's just such a fun, adventurous film that brings a smile on your face every time you watch it. And yes, there are killing dinosaurs killing people. Yes, there are serious elements. But ultimately, all the fun out of every single Jurassic Park movie and the first Jurassic World has been taken away from this movie in favour of something that just really doesn't work. This story, you know, this film only seems to be there to set up the next one, and while that does seem slightly intriguing, you know, what was the point of this movie? I wished I hadn't seen it. So, in at number 15, I've gone for Rampage. Now, this film, I actually thought was okay uh, when I first watched it, but on closer inspection, it just falls down. The special effects are good. I'll give it that. It looks really good, and it seems like a pretty good breakthrough for the special effects and you know some of the performances especially from Je Jeffrey D. Morgan and Dwayne Johnson they're pretty good I'll give you that but the story is just not interesting it feels like something we've seen in so many different things you know the gorilla's just a white version of King Kong you know nothing's interesting is done with the big gorilla and the big crocodile the villains are pants they are so bad the worst villains i've seen in the movie all year they're so bad that it's laughable and they don't fit in this film and i think this movie should have used it the whole premise there it's you know a big monster movie you know a giant crocodile wolf and gorilla fighting each other took its advantage made it fun this film does not do that, it plays it super serious, and any hope of just enjoying this movie for what it is, is completely lost. It had potential to be special, you know, it wasn't ever going to be great, but it had potential to at least bring a smile on your face, but it just makes it pretty forgettable, and to be honest, I almost forgot it existed. So, yep, 
number 14, and it's Maze Runner The Death Cure. Now, this is when I meant by saying that the ratings won't mean anything for the first three films, because I'm pretty sure I rated this like a three and a half stars out of five, but this yet is three off the bottom. And that's because it's just, it's not really this film in particular, but because I really, I really liked the uh, first Maze Runner. I thought it was a really cool idea, them trapped in the maze, and it was, you know, really interesting. But, you know, the other two movies, this and Scorch Trials, are pants. They are bad. And obviously Scorch Trials is worse than this, so, uh, you know, this isn't great, but it has some elements that are slightly intriguing. But I think this Maze Runner franchise started off fairly well. But it's just delved into that whole dystopian truth. Uh, future, you know, adult novel kind of thing where it's like appealing to the young adults, you know, all that stuff like Divergent, Hunger Games, that kind of thing, where it's like you're here because the world is ending and, you know, you're our only hope and this is why you're in here, you know, you think we're doing you wrong but really we, we're doing you right because, you know, look at what the alternative is and, you know, it's the same in Hunger Games, I mean, I haven't read or watched Divergent but I presume it's the same in that. And it's the same in this. It's like we've literally had this premise before where it's revealed, you know, it's like this disease and, you know, you, we need you to help it. And it's like choose your friend or the whole world. And it's like, ah. Oh. I really like the first Mage Runner, but evidently the, you know, originality and uniqueness of that first film didn't apply to the sequels. I haven't read the books, but... You know, it's more of what this film presents. You know, this film is pretty okay to watch, but I know it just devolves into, you know, young adult trope after young adult trope um, after a film that I fairly enjoyed the first one. Number 13, I've gone for Ralph Breaks the Internet. Now, this film got people worried because it seems like, you know, the emoji movie, but Disney. And I was quite worried too, despite really enjoying the first Wreck-It Ralph movie. And I'll say, everything that you you were worried about is actually the best part of this movie. I really enjoyed the internet callbacks and references and the world of the internet. It was really, you know, innovative and original and it was really great to see. And it just made you smile. Obviously, it will date the film fairly, you know, um... Video game callbacks and references are a lot more retro and timeless than, you know, internet callbacks. But for what this film was offering, I thought it actually did that really well and it made it really enjoyable. But it's everything else in this movie that isn't very good. For one, the characters are rubbish. They absolutely are. Ralph and Vanellope had loads of interesting character in the first Wreck at Ralph movie. Where is it? I don't know, because it's not in here. Because Ralph, uh, you know, he's okay, but they make a big deal about how clingy he is. And you're just thinking, is he really? Why are you trying to paint Ralph as the villain? Because he's not. Vanellope just is so stuck up and ungrateful in this. And then it presents her as the one in the right. It, it just it frustrates me because none of the leads are actually that, you know, likeable in this. And there's nothing of an end climax. The film doesn't really have a plot and it's building to nothing. Then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, we'll just plop in, you know, this random climax from somewhere, despite the fact it wasn't leading it to, you know, a massive Ralph made of loads of different Ralphs. And it's just like, what the actual hell? It wasn't building to this. It doesn't flow like the first Wreck-It Ralph movie. And it was a massive disappointment for me. Everything that you knew you were worried about is actually the best part of the movie, but everything you were glad to see returning is the worst part of this movie. Maybe a slightly surprising one, but in at number 12 I've gone for Venom. Yes, Venom! Yes, Venom! Um, now, Venom's not great, um, but it's not terrible. I mean, I like Eddie Brock and Venom's dynamic, I say in my review, that is the best part of this movie. And it's not just the best part of this movie, it's very, very good. Um, I think Tom Hardy's great as, you know, Eddie Brock, and he's great as Venom, and the, you know, the chemistry between them is great, and, you know, the rapport they have, the jokes, like when he's, like, jump out the window, and then he just goes down the lift, and he's just pussy, and, or, like, when he's putting his hands up, he's like, what are you doing? He's like, putting your hands up, and he's like, no, we're not, yes, we are, it's like, this is great stuff, and it's so much solid groundwork to build upon for a sequel with Woody Harrelson's Carnage, I'm totally down for that. 
but the story is fairly generic. It takes too long for Venom to get here, and the villain, Colton Drake, he's awful. He's not very good at all, and he's an embarrassment, to be honest. It would be really good if he played it more comedically, but he doesn't, so it leaves you with, you know, a pants villain who just plays it really straight. Um, and while I'd say Venom's, you know, s s the Simbo looks pretty good, some of the other effects in this movie look quite dodgy, in particular Riot. And you just don't care, I think the story's so generic, but I suppose the one thing it does do, which is, you know, set up Venom, it does really well. So, in at number 11, I've gone for Ready Player One. Now, this film, a lot of people were excited for. I wasn't so excited, because I was kind of cautious, because I thought, you know, it's really, this film's going to be dated a lot, similar to Ralph Breaks the Internet, by, you know, referencing all this stuff. And it will be dated. Um, and while I think, you know, Steven Spielberg directs a good movie, all the visuals are really good. It's a lovely film to look at. There's actually not a lot of interesting story here. And apparently a lot more of the out there things in the book was actually cut in this to make it more of a traditional story, which I think they really should have, you know, left in. And I think there's a few tropey moments like... Um, you know, the stepfather, you know, that is just like, why is that even in this film? Because it almost seems like they're setting up like an abusive stepfather thing. And it just goes nowhere. And you're like, well, what was the point of that? And, you know, I don't think the main guy, um, I, part of all, I don't think he's that great a character. Although the actor is great in a part, the character isn't that strong. And, you know, I think ultimately, I think the visuals are the best part of it. And I think, in terms of the references, I don't think they were handled very well. And I've liked it if you've just kind of seen it and you're like, Ooh, look, look what that is! But no, the film feels the need to point out what it is. Like, there's like Akira's bike or whatever. I, I don't know, I think it's some anime reference. But even though I didn't want to have got the reference, it annoyed me that they had to point that out. Because people who, who are fans of that anime, you know, would probably be annoyed. And, you know, it gets very repetitive where it's like, oh, look at that. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. And you're like, why did you have to point it out? You know, the audience isn't stupid. You know, performances are good in it. You know, um, the visuals are brilliant. But on a story side, it doesn't really do much for me. And for the references, it doesn't do much for me. In at number 10, we've got Johnny English Strikes Again. Uh, now, we're getting into the kind of uh, okay to good movies now. And Johnny English Strikes Again would kind of is the first one that would make up my top 10. Although it's not really a top 10 because I only saw 16 movies. But yes, Johnny English Strikes Again wasn't a film I was, you know, planning on seeing, but one of my friends, uh, you know, invited me to go see it because there wasn't anything else on, um, apart from Venom, but we'd already seen that. So we went and seen this, and, you know, I was dreading it because I'd seen the trailers, and I like, this doesn't look that great. It's been ages since Joy English Reborn, and that had been ages since Joy English, so it's like, what's the point of even making this? Um, but it was good. I enjoyed it. There are some legitimate laugh-out-loud moments, including a scene where I, he gets, like, Johnny gets, like, high on some drug um, instead of his sleeping pills, um, I'm pretty sure, and that is hilarious. Uh, it is literally a laugh-out-loud moment, and this film is very funny for what it is, but I think ultimately it resorts to a kind of formula that you've kind of seen before, and, you know, a villain that is not very good. It's the same actor who plays one of the villains in Rampage, and he's slightly better in this, but he's not great. And there is an interesting point about, you know, Johnny, you know, having to move with the times, which is certainly an interesting thing to explore. And there's a really nice virtual reality scene as well, which does work also. But I think ultimately the former formula has kind of been spent, and I think that this should be the final outing for uh, Johnny English. So, number nine, and we have The Festival. Now, I was anticipating this movie, not only because I love The Inbetweeners after just first watching it, you know, this year. Um, well, I say this year. Last year, I mean. Um, early 2018, I saw The Inbetweeners for the first time, and it's so funny. It's so relatable as well. It's definitely one of the best sitcoms out there. 
and you know, so it's the 10 years of the in between this, and just generally the trailers for this movie looked really good, and I know why. Because they used all the best jokes in the trailer. This is one of the cardinal sins for comedies. Don't you put all your best jokes in the trailers, and the festival does. But ultimately, it's still very funny, very entertaining. I think the actual situation of the festival actually lends a lot of, uh, you know, comedy to this film, and it's a very good place to have jokes around. I think the performances are good, especially from Joe Thomas, Ahmed Hamashor, Hamad Ashorn, um, I think that's how you say it, um, and also um, Jermaine Clement. Um, they're all very good, very funny, um, although there is a character with Claudio Dahidi who does kind of verge on the slightly irritating side. Um, overall, I do think it's quite funny. There is an annoying thing, like I said, they spoil all the jokes in, in the trailers, and there's some plot points that are literally copy and pasted from the in-betweeners, like even the initial setup is copy and pasted from the start of the first in-betweeners movie. But ultimately, um, I do think while this film could have been better, it was ultimately still fairly enjoyable. Number eight, and I've gone with Solo, a Star Wars story. Now, this film, I actually fairly enjoyed it. I wasn't really anticipating it, or the idea of a Han Solo movie anyway, but the trailer slightly got me hyped, although I wasn't convinced on Alden Ehrenreich as Han Solo. I thought he was pretty good. I thought Lando was pretty well played by Donald Glover. Mia Clark was good, you know, Woody Harrelson, Paul Bettany. Um, I wasn't a fan of L3. Oh, I think the story, while it's pretty generic, is just kind of a fun ride and it kind of brings you know the funness of Star Wars back after The Last Jedi and I think this is almost what we kind of needed was just you know a fun Star Wars movie and I think this is what it gives us the kind of villains there's not really a great antagonist in this and there's some weird reveals like with Emphis Nest and Darth Maul that it's weird I I, I understand he comes back um, you know, in Clone Wars and Rebels, but, you know, his placement in this movie felt, felt so odd. Uh, the film looks good, though, and overall, I think it's definitely what we needed after The Last Jedi. Obviously, it, the future of, you know, these are Star Wars story movies are, is up in the air after this film didn't do very well in the box office. But I think if you are kind of annoyed about the initial concept of there being a young Han Solo movie, I don't think uh, you'd hate it um, as much as you probably think you would. Although I'd say part some of the facts are like, here's how he got his blaster, here's how he met Chewie, here's how he got the dice, here's how he got the Millennium Falcon, you know, this is why Lando calls Han Han, you know, this is why he calls Chewbacca Chewie. You know, um, here's how he got his name, which is just ridiculous. All these things, it's kind of like, did he really just get this all on this one mission? And it's like, apparently so. So some of them could have kind of been, you know, left out in, um, in favour of just doing a Han Solo movie rather than like the origins of Han Solo. But overall, I fairly enjoyed this movie. Number seven, we've gone for Aquaman. Now, Aquaman, I thought, was a fairly enjoyable film, and it's one of the best of the DCEU. I mean, it's not going to blow anyone away, because the story is kind of, you know, um, fairly... Well, it's not original, um, but I think the visuals are good, and I think Jason Momoa brings so much to Aquaman that he's a great character to watch, and I think, you know... Um, just seeing this world and the world building of Atlantis, I think it's, it's great. And anyone who kind of complained, it's like, oh, there's no Atlantis in Justice League. You, you're going to get it in here. Um, there's so much Atlantis in here. And I think it's great that Aquaman in the water and at the end of the film, he's the king of Atlantis. So by the time the next Justice League film rolls around, if it does roll around, you know, he'll be up to full speed. Because, you know, when you think in Justice League, he kind of felt like a bit of a B-Tech Superman, a bit of a rubbish four, um, a rubbish DC four. Um, and his powers weren't that dissimilar from Superman, apart from Superman's generally better. But I think now he's in his element in this film, he's pretty good. The film looks great. James Wan has a great visual style. If there was anything to complain about, it would be mainly, you know, um, the story is kind of predictable. And also, you know, uh, the Ocean Master isn't the best for them. 
and Black Manta is underused. But overall, I enjoyed this film. Number six, I've gone for Deadpool 2. Now, Deadpool 2 was one of my most highly anticipated films of the year, and it's, I think it's fair to say it paid off. There are some things that aren't so great in this movie. I think the first 30, 40 minutes are a bit of a slog, and it's kind of just has Deadpool kind of doing meaningless stuff, like just going around the X Mansion, which is funny in concept, but it goes on for far too long. Um, and a lot of the characters, uh, in particular, uh, Colossus and the exciting Teenage Warhead actually didn't need to return in this movie but I think the rest of it is really funny I think seeing uh, Deadpool as an X-Man trainee is quite funny to watch him being in the icebox it's really nice to explore that Russell as a character is really good you know Cable is brilliant you know uh, Domino is great that scene where he assembles the X-Force is one of the funniest things I've seen all year when they're all just immediately killed it's hilarious. And I think ultimately when, you know, Deadpool eventually dies, you it gets you more than you kind of expect. And there's some really nice callbacks as well. Juggernaut's in this. He doesn't look great, but it's nice to see him. Um, performed by Ryan Reynolds as well. Really nice to see the, you know, the X-Force, you know, um, grey suit that Deadpool wears briefly. And I think Deadpool's, you know, full of all breaking nature uh, is something you never get tired of. There's loads of references in this from of the Avengers to the DCEU to everything. Um, and it's just, you know, it's so hilarious. I'm not sure if we'll get a Deadpool 3. Um, obviously, there's Once Upon a Deadpool, which just looks pretty naff. But obviously, well, I'm not sure whether we're going to get like an actual Deadpool 3 because of the whole Fox Marvel agreement. But I think it's a perfect send-off for the character if this is to be his last outing. Bringing into the top five now, I've gone for Black Panther. Now, I have gone on record to say this film is fairly overrated, and I would say it is. I don't think it's one of the best Marvel movies. I'm not going to lie, I think it's up there, but it's not my favourite Marvel movie. I think there are weaknesses, and I think Killmonger as a villain is one of them. I don't think he's that great as a villain. Shoot me. Um, Michael B. Jordan's performance is good, but I think he's pretty useless as a villain, and he doesn't actually have that great a presence. But I do love uh, Chadwick Boseman as Black Panther, and I think, you know, the whole vibe of this movie, Wakanda, is a great world to explore, and I think everything with the technology, that's visually very cool. I think, you know, the music in this is really good, the actual score as well, using, like, techno and some African instruments, and then some of those just general music, like Kendrick Lamar, that's really cool. Um... And I would say it is pretty good. Um, you know, obviously, my weakness is mainly Killmonger um, and the story. I don't think the story is particularly original. It's a very similar story to Aquaman that I talked about previously. Um, and I would rather have seen, you know, Claw in it than Killmonger. I thought he was a much more interesting villain and a lot more entertaining to watch. But overall, I did enjoy Black Panther, and I think it's just a lovely... I just love the vibe of this movie more than anything. Number four will be quite surprising to some people, but not if you watch my review. Ant-Man and the Wasp. I really enjoyed this film. I almost forgot it was coming out, like quite a few people, but I think it was the required palate cleanser after both Black Panther and Infinity War. Yes, this movie isn't necessary to watch. Yes, it's not doing anything particularly... Different. Yes, it is, you know, very, you know, low stakes, just a fun movie, but that's what I love about it. I love to have fun when I watch a movie. You know, it's great doing dark, great stories, it's great doing serious, life bending stakes. But I love that this film is just, you know, the low stakes, you know, they're just having fun. It's a comedy. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed it. I was watching it with a smile on my face. Paul Rudd as that man. I'll never get tired of watching him. You know, Evangeline Lilly as, you know, the Wasp works. She's really good. Michael Douglas, you know, Michael Pena, you know, Lawrence Fishbourne, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet. And I think although some of the villains aren't great, I think the set pieces are amazing. All the shrinking gadgets with the salt dispenser and the Pez dispenser are great. And there's a really nice chase sequence, which with all the shrinking stuff, it's really interesting to watch. Obviously, you know, um, this film isn't one of the best, but I really enjoyed it, and I think it thoroughly deserves this fourth spot. 
Number three, we've gone with Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. I love this movie. I was slightly cautious watching going into it. I wasn't sure what I was going to expect, despite the fact that, uh, you know, the reviews were fairly great. And I love this movie. I think for a big fan of Spider-Man, this is exactly what I wanted. I am slightly aware of the character of Miles, but I'm not, you know, the most familiar. So this kind of made me aware of a lot more of the background knowledge on Miles. Although I was away, you know, Aaron Davis, his uncle, is the Prowler, and that he is from another dimension. I wasn't really sure on some of the other things. But ultimately, I think Miles is a great character. I love the other characters in this movie. I was unsure whether, you know, a debut movie... For Miles would work with the Spider-Verse storyline. But it really works actually. And they intertwine those elements brilliantly. I love the Peter Parker who's kind of down on his luck, you know, but he's still great. Um presumably from our universe. I like the Peter Parker from their universe. I like Spider Ham I love, and you know, Spider Gwen I really like. Spider Man Noir I really like. The only one I'm not so sure on is that kind of anime schoolgirl kind of spider in a robot kind of thing. But overall, I think it's great. I think Kingpin, you know, he's uh, actually really nice to have as an actual primary antagonist in this. I think that animation is beautiful. And I like small little touches where it's just like a bit like a comic book. I really love that. Um, and, you know, I love the different references to comic books. And the, the music actually in this I actually do like as well. There won't be something I'd de- like on paper. Overall, I think this movie is really good, and that's why it's number three. Number two, I've gone with Mission Impossible Fallout. Now, I love the Mission Impossible franchise. I love that they don't rely on CG, and, you know, they just kind of, you know, uh, do it old style. And I like it really good, with really good use of, you know, models and stunt work, and it all looks really great. And Mission Impossible and Fallout is no exception to this rule. There's some legitimately great action sequences, like one on a helicopter. And my favourite, personally, is one where, you know, um, they are driving this truck through Paris. And they, you know, bosh one of the cars into the water. And it submerges Solomon Lane. And then they have to go on a getaway from the French police and they get stuck for his tight alleyway and then they need to bash through you know the window with the front window and get out and it's just such an imaginative great action sequence tom cruise is great you'd think is he still capable of it at his age yes he is he's great as ethan hunt i love simon pegg just as an actor and his character benji dunn is really great you know vin rames angela bassett sean harris alec baldwin um, you know, um, Rebecca Ferguson, Henry Cavill, he's great, um, as Walker, I didn't see that coming either, I think it gives so many twists and turns, I think the score is great by Lord Balfe, Christopher McQuarrie is great as directing, um, and I think it's just a great movie, you're thinking that, and it's just, although it's a long movie, you never get bored of it, it never stops going, and that's why it's number two for me, I love this film, it's my favourite Mr. Impossible movie, and therefore it's going to be one of my favourite movies of the year. And number one, I think everyone will have uh, foreseen this, Avengers Infinity War. I, I love Fallout, and I gave it a 5 out of 5 stars, but I think Infinity War was always going to edge this. I think, as a Marvel fan, and there's so many years in the making as this coming, I think it was always going to be my top spot if it was good, and it's great. Um, you know, the actual you know team-up possibilities is great as well. You see loads of heroes with characters that you never quite thought they'd cross paths, um, and I think that's all really great. The film visually is amazing. Um, and I think the Russo brothers really did really good, great stuff. And the use of CGI as well. It looks so realistic, particularly on Thanos. Talking of Thanos, Josh Brolin is brilliant. He's brilliant as Thanos and he's my favourite character in the movie. Because you kind of understand where he's going. But ultimately he is a madman. And he is the main character in this movie. If I was to have you know, a criticism with it, it's the fact that some people don't get all, uh, as much screen time. And sometimes you'll cut away from a certain group of characters and won't return to them for quite a while. And you'll kind of think, what were we doing here again? But overall I think it's brilliant. I think it's one of the best cinema experiences I've ever had. Um, just... I think it would be the best. You know, all these Marvel fans, the cinema was packed, and it was just brilliant. It subverts your expectations so much. You're just watching the end credits, and you're just like, what the hell just happened? And it's like, it just leaves you with your jaw dropped, and you're like, what the hell? I don't know how they're going to re- uh, resolve this in Avengers 4, obviously not titled Endgame. 
and um, yeah, it just makes it great. But I think the whole sim the whole movie is great. It's not just that you know reveal at the end. It's all fantastic, and you know I think if this was good, it was always gonna make my my number one spot for my favorite movie of the year, and it was spectacular. So there you have it, all the movies ranked, all 16 of them. Number 16, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Number 15, Rampage. Number 14, Mage Runner Death Gear. Number 13, Ralph Breaks the Internet. Number 12, Venom. Number 11, Ready Player One. Number 10, Johnny English Strikes Again. Number 9, The Festival. Number 8, Solo, A Star Wars Story. Number 7, Aquaman. Number 6, Deadpool 2. Number 5, Black Panther. Number 4, Ant-Man and the Wasp, number 3, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, number 2, Mission Impossible Fallout, and number 1, Avengers Infinity War. So I hope you've enjoyed this ranking. Also, I was tempted to do a top 10, but obviously I couldn't because I only done 6 movies, no, 16 movies. So uh, I decided, you know, to um, just rank them, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I do plan to, you know, do more regular movie reactions for movies I'm going to see in 2019, so stay tuned for that. So thank you guys for watching, if you enjoyed this video leave a like and drop a sub and hit that notification bell, stay notified for all my latest videos. Obviously the last video that's technically 2018 I'll be releasing in a couple of days time which is my review or more of a rant of the Doctor Who New Year's special resolution so stay tuned for that if you want to watch it. Thank you guys for watching and of course a goodbye.